Rolling on, it is a special finale edition of the Pat Richter Show right here on 100.5 ESPN, the ESPN app, and Wisconsin On Demand. Alex Strofe and the legendary Pat Richter with you live from the Everlight Solar Studio, downtown Madison. Excited to be joined now by two fellow Wisconsin legends. Number one, we have a, a, a young Jason Wildey in the 90s covering all things Badgers athletics. And we have another Badgers legend who Pat may or may not have earlier referred to as uh, the Pillsbury Doe. Oh boy, uh, that would be the. Boy, that the doesn't great, sound like the, something. The Pat great Richter would do. Mark Tauscher <laughs> join us now on the finale edition of the Pat Richter Show, fellas. Thanks for doing this, and I, I know you guys, and we talked about it a little bit before, have such a unique relationship with Pat. You're, you're our longest running daily show on ESPN Madison. I know he's played such a fun role on your show, so really appreciate you guys taking the time. Yeah, I I love to joke around with Pat Richter, and it, it's th- I I laugh now thinking about it, but. Um, 1995, I am a walk-on at the University of Wisconsin. I don't know anything about anything. You could say I still don't. Mm -hmm. But I I go down, and we would just gotten started. I have maybe two or three days on campus, and we're doing two-a-days. We're down lifting. We're working out, and there's just a bunch of us walk-ons. There's probably 10 or 11 of us walk-ons. And we get done, and Pat's working out. He's doing his stairmaster yoga, Pilates, the whole deal. Everything, <laughs> you know. He was always new aged ahead of the time, and we all respect every time Pat would get up to talk. You know, whether at seminary or whatever, it was always how many Hall of Fames he was in, and everything else. So here he is, this just monster of a personality and just a legend. Three sports, all of the stuff everybody knows about it, and. Why I really was drawn to Pat and became really good friends with and just respect. I don't know if there's anybody I respect more. And it stems from I go in, and again, I'm three days on campus, number 142, or number 140 issue geared. In the old, the old days where you get the stuff and they'd stuff it in your locker. I'm bottom right, 140. I think there's only two other lockers left. <laughs> And I go in to get a Badger Max, which is an old drink, and you know they'd mix it with the with the big ore, and <laughs> you put product. your cup. Great you, product. Yes, great product. Did you invent that? No, no, Dave Ellis. Dave Ellis. Well, I go and I put the cup, and I push it up there, and Pat comes up and says, "Hey, Mark, how are you?" And, and I'm thinking, "Wow, how on earth does Pat Richter know? Have any clue? Huh? There's 130 other guys on the team." And that was to me, I just, that was one of those moments that I'll never forget. And it helped me feel a little more comfortable. It felt that I was actually known, where I don't think a lot of other coaches and players had any clue. <laughs> but that was one of those moments that drew me. And that's uh, just the starting point. And then obviously, I've asked Pat a lot of different ideas whether or not I should do this show with Jason Wildy. He said, absolutely not. I went against him. Probably should have listened to him. But it's just, he has just been such a, he's just such a, such a legend at the university, and I am just, man, so thankful that I've, got, I've been able to have a relationship with Pat now for 20-some-odd years. You know, the, I think, Mark, the thing that really, uh, as you talk about this, meant a lot to me is the fact I had heard about your basketball prowess. This kid, and because the Tillbury Dobor thing is maybe over or reaching a little bit too far. No, Ron Wolf said it too, so it's, <laughs> hey, it is what it is, Pat. The I, legends I, agree. Yeah. But anyway, because the uh, the fact was is you had better feet than anybody, and that was one thing that I always looked at with respect to the, uh, the linemen and everything else because size didn't really matter. It was a question of feet. I always said, well, why don't you get him into you know martial arts, uh, and karate, things like this, foot, sort of footwork and handball, things like that, because that really helped a lot. But I think the fact that uh, you were a multi-sport, Made the decision to come here, but the fact that uh, a lot of people thought you were a hell of a good basketball player. Pat, uh, when when you look back at your entire career, what's the one thing, whether it's sports, administration, Oscar Mayer, whatever it was, what's the one thing that has made you successful? If I had to get you to pin it down to one thing. Well, I think that uh, probably the fact that the people that know me in the neighborhood, in fact, I can still play cards with guys I grew up with. You really haven't changed a lot. That means an awful lot. And I think, in fact, after I finished at the athletic director's job, the thing that I really uh, enjoyed the most was just getting mixing around. I remember the first game I was going to go to, I was going to wear some shorts, 
And Renee says, you can't wear shorts to a game. I said, I don't have anybody to impress. I'm, I'm not <laughs> working anymore. I'm going to walk around. I'm going to wear what I want and be comfortable. And the people that came up and just said, thank you. And I think that that was something that I would relate to them because being a fan and going to the games and seeing where everything has come from and the fact that the people had lost the kind of their faith in what the athletic program has been all about. And then all of a sudden it started to get building and building and building. You could see that the people, even though they didn't talk about it a lot, it meant a hell of a lot to them. And that said, just thank you. And that means more than anything else. And so uh, I think that it's just more of the internal type things, the relationships, the fact that I was fortunate enough to play some professional ball and then go to Oscar Mayer, which is a great organization that taught you an awful lot about culture, about people, how you treat people. And uh, just trying to be uh, not necessarily nice, but understand it when the fellows that uh, have to make tough decisions to uh, make a change. For example, I remember uh, Jerry Hegel at Oscar Mayer. He said every time he made a decision, 11,000 people depended on that decision. So whether it was a coach deciding whether he needed to make a change in coaching, I said, you you have to make that decision because you're going to be held accountable for it. And so... That was the main thing. Not be unreasonable, just be accountable. Pat, Tausch mentioned you knowing his name. And for me, I have a similar story as a student reporter covering Badger sports. You have for the that Badger hoop earring? Girl. You remember he had the hoop earring that it got infected and his ear swelled up? He had a bandana around his head. It's really more Alvarez's <laughs> issue with the earring than Pat's. But be that as it may, you know, I was, again, like Tausch said, and you just mentioned relationships in being one of your most important things that you developed in all the different roles you had over the years. And for me, the fact that Pat Richter knew my name as a student reporter at the Badger Herald was a really big deal. And you made everyone feel that way. And I always appreciate that. I've talked about it a bunch of times between you and Coach Alvarez and Kevin Cosgrove and uh, Palermo, who I was afraid of, and Chile. I mean, I learned so much, and I would hope that Barry and everyone else that I just mentioned can look at the career I've had as a reporter and say, you know what, we helped that guy not be a complete idiot and actually turn out to be pretty good at this job. I am curious, though, because you just referenced Oscar Mayer. It's 1989. I am not on campus yet. I am one of those people that we talk on this show about Packers fans and not knowing what it can be like without Brett Favre or Aaron Rodgers. Well, before you arrived, before Donna Shalala convinced you to take over the athletic department, uh, things were bleak. And I was a freshman for Barry's first year as the head coach, so I experienced just the tail end of those challenging times. But I'm wondering, when Donna Shalala comes to you and says, we need you to save us, why did you say yes? And was there any point where you thought, oh, my gosh, what have I gotten myself into here? Well, yes to all of them. But I think probably the first thing is that uh, she, I, I was never – in a position to say yes, well, I was in a position to say it, but I didn't say it because I really didn't didn't think that I was the right person for the job. I, I like my privacy, the family business uh, of getting, the, uh, we have four boys, they're all involved in different things. i just not sure being from Madison that you really wanted to get into that. And so I actually was out recruiting Bob Johnson to be the athletic director I because my son was playing hockey and, and uh, so I knew Bob. And got started talking. We never really got down seriously, but I was kind of just saying, would you be interested in this job? And eventually things changed at Oscar Mayer with uh, Kraft being uh, uh, picked up by Philip Morris, etc. I could see my position moving to Chicago. It was a good job, no question about it, but we didn't want to be in Chicago. And that's when I changed my mind. And so she kind of went through uh, Jim McVeigh, who was my boss and a very close friend of mine, and and I said, well, I'm going to go after him, and Jim would kind of funnel that to me. But uh, it was uh, it was something that was really questionable, and uh, and I think in terms of jumping to the point about what a surprise, I talked to uh, uh, Alex about the fact that uh, the first day of my press conference, I had a, we had a conference call in the Big Ten. Donna had alerted me the fact that the Penn State was coming into the Big Ten, 
But obviously, the, the athletic directors hadn't been really alerted. And so Bo Schembechler asked Doug Weaver, who was the chair, said, Weave, did you know anything about this uh, expansion? He said, no, I didn't. Well, you can imagine what Bo said, but I can't say it on the air. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I said, oh, boy, what am I going to get myself into here? This is the first day, and now this is what it's come to. And so then as I went up to the, the office, and uh, the person who was an assistant there, I sat in my desk for a second, and I came in with a handful of messages and said, this message is from Bill, this message. And I said, wait a minute, here, I'll take all of those things. At Oscar Meyer, they'd had a, a uh, call director phone and everything else. Well, in, at the athletic department, there was a red phone. If it rang, you had to answer it. You couldn't, you couldn't transfer it. You couldn't uh, put it on hold. You had to answer <laughs> the damn thing. Otherwise, it would just keep ringing all day long. And so it was a change. Was shag carpeting on the floor, you know, paneling. It was 1950s stuff. And mo most of all, it was just uh, the people... Uh, you know, hoping that they were solidly behind you because they felt that, that there's, you know, things had kind of run its course. And uh, they were very archaic. The investments hadn't been made. But it was it was tough. And when we started dealing with budgets and uh, first year having to come up with a million dollars more the next year just to stay even and the ripple effects of all those things, that wasn't uh, any fr frivolities and things like this. It was just to stay even, really kind of give you a, a dose of reality. And this, this legislature always liked to uh, get, in, get in your business, uh, the Finance Committee, because they had uh, proven that they couldn't handle it. And, uh, and so we had to overcome a lot of that negativism. But uh, over a period of time, nothing helps more than winning. And when that started to happen, then uh, things started to change a little bit. Well, Pat, I don't want to miss the opportunity to just simply say thank you to you. Uh, thank you for the way you have treated me for the last <clears throat> 30 years um, from when I was a student to now. Uh, thank you for the, I'm not going to lie, saving the athletic department from itself. Um, I appreciate everything you did for me personally and you did for the university. I got to cover a Rose Bowl as a senior because you hired Barry Alvarez and everything changed after that, much like Bob Harlan, who I also admire and think the world of like I do with you. Sometimes the people who make those decisions don't get as much credit as the coaches that make the victories happen, which I understand. But I'm just so appreciative to you. But I have to ask this because I've never asked you this in the 30 years I've known you. How the heck does Hugh Vernon Richter become Pat? <laughs> well, <War> <laughs> that's a great question. Great question, Jason. It's not as tough as you think. Warner Wolf out in Washington always used it as a, a trivia question, and uh, it was I was a junior. My dad was named Hugh Vernon uh, Richter, senior, and I was junior. He was born on St. Patrick's Day, so he had a nickname of Pat. And then as we grew up, I became he was Big Pat, I was Little Pat, and then he unfortunately passed away at a young age of 43 when I was at the university. But uh, I've kept it, it's really been a kind of a, uh, a burden in some respects of change. Well, when you're driving your license, you try to explain, well, who's Pat? So I'd have a Hugh Richter on a picture in a, a license plate, but I'd sign it Pat, and that doesn't go so far. So it's always stuck with me, And uh, but it was little Pat, big Pat, but then I became taller than my dad, and then it got confusing. So uh, that's the way it is. and. Uh, it's uh, that's the rest of the story. It's not as exciting as you might think. Huh. Well, well, Hugh Vernon. All I can tell you is this: in my time as a Badger, I have never owned a Wisconsin jersey. I would wear a number eighty-eight jersey. I would do that because that's how much you meant to me, and I appreciate everything you've done. One thing I wanted to mention, Jason, I appreciate that very much. Is that you have to remember? You remember the, the number of writers and everything was kind of negative, and it was it was had to be proven otherwise. Otherwise, they weren't going to get on board, and it was changed. It was very I don't know why it happened that way, but it was a lot of animosity, and uh, and that took a while to break. So, I, the fact that the people like yourself took time to listen and be objective and and give us time to move things along, it really meant an awful lot. So that's why. Uh, you didn't get any special treatment, put it that way, but uh, you, the treatment you deserved. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I don't know if you want to get into it, but I got a great bow, Harlan. Let's so. hear it. 
we had the we were talking about uh when the replacement for Bob was going to take place we were having a meeting on the Packer board and uh they were talking about the new process there was a fellow named Mark Murphy he's going to say a few words and he's a possible candidate and then, and Bob talked about things about how the process is going to be and so he but he kind of deviated and he said now if you really want to be particular he says if somebody like Pat Richter, if Pat was his just younger age, he's the kind of person we'd want to do this job. So they said a few things a little later, uh, and then finally I raised my hand, and I said, Bob, I, I just would like to ask a question, but first I'd like to introduce you to my attorney. We're filing an age discrimination lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. It, it, broke the, it broke up the, the, the quietness in the room, and Bob got a big <laughs> kick out of it. And our is... birthdays are on the same day, September 9th. That is Awesome. <laughs> Pat, before I guess Jason and I uh, take off, um, I'm always curious because great leaders let their people lead too. But when we were at uh, one of the defining games in the Barry Alvarez era is that Ohio State game. We had come off a Rose Bowl. We had Brooks Bollinger come in to play quarterback. We're down 17 nothing, And that was one time you decided to come in and talk to us, which never happened. I guess what made you that day come in and decide to say something to our group? Well, you're going to bring tears to my eyes because it meant so much. Uh, it was a special being more of an alum, somebody that followed Wisconsin football to see what had happened, to see the kind of a watershed moment to have them come back and experience that kind of ex- an experience itself. To win that game was, uh, I think, everybody that viewed that game, whether you're an alum or not, we're very proud of the way you guys play that day. and Because I, I didn't want to get in the middle of the coach. I never liked to say those things, but I think it had to be said that you represented an awful lot of people, and that game was very special. Yeah, uh, and I think we're all speaking. I'll speak for Jason, which I usually don't do. We could not admire, respect, and love somebody more. We appreciate everything that you've done, and what a heck of a ride. If any of us can do half the stuff that you've been able to do throughout your life, Woo! What a ride. Thanks. I appreciate that very much. Now the, the body's a little worse for wear, but... Uh, when you're you're still getting around. You're still golfing. <laughs> and I don't know. I'll have to ask Bob Harlan how old you are. I, he probably thinks you probably shouldn't be golfing anymore. I'll be 82 in September. What a run. What a run indeed. And Tosh, I'm so glad you brought up that story at Ohio State because we've talked about that countless times, Pat, right? One of the few times, if, if not the only ever time, you, you went down and spoke to the team. Uh, and I just think that's such a kick-ass story. So I'm glad Tausch, you brought that up. Jason, Tausch. Uh, well, res- I'll say this. Yeah, we, you don't forget those things. No and doubt. When, when you, it's one thing if somebody's blustery and doing it all the time. When Pat Richter speaks, people listen. Tell that to my family, would you please? <laughs> well, for sure your grandkids don't. And I know Renee's got you out there gardening and doing Lord knows what. So. I'm looking for golf balls. <laughs> yeah. So, Pat, You're, by the way, if this is the uh, if this is the farewell to the Pat Richter show, does that mean Tausch and I can get you scheduled for a weekly appearance on our program <laughs> and you'll be doing that for free? Is that you've got enough room in your schedule? Because we'll still take you if you want. I'll be ready anytime. I, I have to make sure I got to bone up on these things because I remember talking with on the show about uh, NBA basketball and things like this, and I got off the air and my call, the phone rang and it was my son Barry, and he says, "What the hell do you know about the NBA?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, oh, yeah. hey, I say that same thing to Wildy every day on the show, so True, that's why actually. we talk Packers almost exclusively. True that. Well, if, th- if that's any indication about how Pat feels about working with me, we'll, we'll, we'll be joined by his other two former co-hosts, and Bill Johnson and Jim Rutledge, coming up next. Wildy Tash, appreciate you guys. Thanks so much. This is the finale edition of the Pat Richter Show, rolling on right after this.